Hey, so um, to start us out this morning, I want you to interact with me for a little bit. Just, just one question I got for you, but I want you to raise your hand, okay? So here's the question. Have you ever, something's happened in your life, and have you ever asked the question, what is God doing in my life? Now, see, see many hands you've asked that question? All right, I don't know about the rest of you not raising your hand. But anyways, you know, like money runs out before the month runs out, you know? What are you doing in my life, Lord? The doctor gives the bad diagnosis, the spouse walks away from Christ, your coworker gets you fired, your child isn't responding to your discipline, or it's like, um, I don't know, my car breaks down. It's like, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in my life? Well, what we've been seeing from Galatians chapter 5, and really for the past couple months, is no matter what's happening in your life, God is always doing this in your life. He is always making you holy. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to make Christians holy, to make us more like Jesus. What we've been seeing also is that he, and that happens in our life to a greater or lesser degree when we what? Run out of batteries. I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay. So we're going to edit this part right here. So we're going to start that sentence over again. All right? Okay. So the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian is to make us holy, and that happens in your life and in my life to a greater or lesser degree when we what? When we follow his leadership into holiness. We just read verse 17. There's, there is a civil war in the Christian, right? If you're a Christian, you feel that civil war. There's a civil war between the flesh and its desire to take you into sin and, and between the spirit and the flesh. And, the, and here's the spirit saying, hey, we, we're going to move you into holiness, that there are these conflicting desires inside of the Christian so that you don't do the things you want to do. So when you want to sin, the Spirit is right, they're stopping you. But when you want to do right, the flesh is there trying to justify disobedience. And you feel that if you're a Christian. You know that experience. I'm not saying anything that's not your life. Well, when we want to sin, we, the, the flesh is there and we hate this. If you are a Christian, you hate that anti-God tendency in your heart. So the question is, how do you and I respond to this? How should we respond to this? What has God allowed us, what has God given us in order to respond rightly? That's our passage this morning. Remaining sin, what Paul calls the flesh, is a burden. So how do we respond to this burden? How do we carry this burden? How do we help other people carry this burden in their lives? This tendency to sin, to give in to temptation, to do things we hate, to do things we're embarrassed about, that lingers in our lives like the smell of cigarettes and carpet. Okay, it just stinks up our lives, it stains our relationships, it ruins our testimonies. No Christian likes the temptation to dishonor God. No Christian is proud of the times that we defy Jesus. Christians care deeply about remaining sin in our lives. Every Christian hates it, every Christian is burdened by it, every Christian cannot wait until we are free from it, right? We hate the sin around us, we hate the sin inside of us, we long for the day when we are free from sinning. So what do we do between that day and this day? How do we respond to this lingering burden of the flesh? Our text has the answer to that question. So let's jump in and take a look. What, is, what does God give us through the Apostle Paul to help us respond to this lingering burden? Verse 24, let's start there. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Notice the text. A Christian is someone who what? Now, what does it say? A Christian belongs to Christ. There's not one Christian who does not belong to Christ. To belong to Jesus is to be a Christian, is to be saved. It is, it, 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 so the question to start us out this morning is, is that how you view yourself? Is that how, is that how you think about yourself? That, that Jesus owns you, that you are owned. You have no freedom to do what you want if you're a Christian. You are free to do what he wants you to do. It's his will, not yours. It's his goal, not yours. It's his ways, his words, his desires, not yours. That's what it means to be a Christian, and not one iota less than that. Now, all those who belong to Jesus, notice the text. They've accomplished something. They've done something. Did you, did you see what they did? Look at the text. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
So this is true about every single life of every single person that belongs to Christ. They have done this. Notice the text. It does not say that this is something God does. This is not something God does for them. This is not something God does to them. Look at the text. Who's the active participant in the verb to crucify? It's the Christian. The Christian has decisively, actively, with resolve and finality, crucified the flesh with its cravings for wickedness, its appetite for evil, its pressure to sin. They nailed their flesh to the cross. They dealt the death blow to the, to the flesh. So from this, we learn that you respond rightly to the flesh when point number one, you deny yourself. You actively deny yourself. And you might be thinking, now wait a minute, that text doesn't give me a command. It doesn't tell me to do anything. It, it tells me what I already did. True. And that is true. But what we're going to see is that while crucifying the flesh is a one-time one decisive act, it is also an ongoing commitment in the life of the Christian. Amen. So why must I do this, if, this is already, if, if the flesh has already been crucified? Because even though the flesh has been crucified, it's not dead yet. It's been given a mortal wound. It's dying, but it hasn't taken its last breath. It lingers. And in its lingering, it's seeking to influence you and me into sin. It's still present in our lives, but it is not the president over our lives. It still influences our lives, but it is not the influence of our lives. The influence in our lives is Jesus. And here's what he said, Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This right here, this text, is the start of the Christian life. This gives us more detail into what, it, what, what happened when you crucified the flesh, when it's passions and desires, if you're a Christian. This is what it means to believe in Jesus. This is what it means to trust him. This is what it means to be saved. So let's take a look at, the, the, at, at these three verbs. The first one is deny. That word means to disown, to turn away from, to reject, to refuse to associate with. So this is the same word used for what, for what Peter did with all of those people around him on the night that Jesus was crucified. It says that he denied Jesus three times, this word. He refused to associate. I'm, I'm not with him. I don't know who that is. I, I have no idea. That, that's what he's saying, that we have denied, we have disassociated ourselves from the flesh, from ourselves. This is what happened when Christians began to belong to Christ. They stopped belonging to themselves and their sins, and they began to belong to Christ. They renounced their self-righteousness, their sinful independence. They, they said, I don't want any of that. I, they, they said, I am the biggest hindrance between me and Jesus, and so I'm done with me so I can have Christ. They saw this, and they said, I'm denying myself. I'm refusing to associate with myself so that I can have Christ. Notice, number two, they take up their cross. Now, when someone took up their cross, they were, they were walking to their place of execution. With, this, with, with these words, Jesus is describing the commitment level he expects from those who belong to him. This is, he says the commitment is so high, it is so big, that, 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 I'm, that he's saying even to the point of death is your commitment. Even if I call you to die for me, he says, that's the, that's the level of commitment. Highest possible allegiance, in other words. So what Paul does is he takes this image a step further. We don't just take up our cross and walk with it. We make sure that the execution happens. And then from there, notice, it's about following Jesus. And what that means is that that loyalty to him, that commitment to him remains. It abides. It continues to the very end. Again, this is where Christianity starts. This isn't upper level, you know, higher level management Christianity. This is the entrance to Christianity. All in lifelong commitment to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Jesus put it this way, John 12, 25. Whoever loves his life, Whoever holds on to his flesh, whoever refuses to disassociate himself from the, from the sinful rebellion that he has, who, whoever loves his life, he's going to lose it. Whoever hates his life, hates his rebellion, hates his sin, in this world will keep it for a higher level of Christianity? What? Will keep it for eternal life. The biblical theological word for what I've been describing here is repentance. 
Like faith, repentance is a gift from God. Like faith, there is no salvation without repentance. Repentance is the crucifying of the flesh with its passions and desires. It is a decisive change of loyalty from self to Jesus, from self-righteousness for supposed good works and, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm this, this good person, to humiliation for sin, to being done with myself, to being done with the person that I am in my rebellion and surrendering to Jesus. See, kid, if that hasn't happened in your life, if there's no repentance, if there's been no fundamental change in your life, when, when it comes to your life in relation to your sin, your life in relation to who's now in charge, then hear me, please, there's no salvation there. Now, repentance, that, that may be why God has brought you here today. You may be like, oh, yeah, I've been going to church, blah, blah, like, yeah, churchy, blah, blah, blah. But if fundamentally, at your core, there has not been a change of allegiance from you to Jesus, then, then hear me. Like I said, there's no salvation there. Now, repentance is not just a one-time decisive choice. It is an ongoing lifestyle for the Christian. It is a decision that has consequences. And really, when you think about it, crucifixion is a perfect illustration for this, right? Because, I mean... When someone is crucified, they don't die instantly. They linger. I've read accounts of people lasting a week on the cross. It is a slow, painful, excruciating way to die. And in the same way, the flesh has been crucified. You have repented of your sins, but that flesh is still alive. It's still active. It's still working. It's seeking to influence you. It's trying to exert that power over your life just like it had over your life before you were saved. Then, yeah, it did rule your life. However, you dealt it a death blow at repentance. But its death is slow, right? And its death is painful, and it's trying to, trying to say, hey, listen to me, hey, look at me, hey, help me, hey, feed me. So the goal of this point here is that you and I will not give CPR to the flesh, that we will not give it food and water and medicine, that we won't try to like help it down off the crowd, that the cross and rehabilitate it by listening to it, by giving in to its passions and desires. No, the goal is to kill it. But my concern is that we, and I say we, myself included, we don't hate sin enough to actually do much of anything about it. We've made peace with it. Like, oh, I can't be perfect and God knows it and so he forgives, what's the big deal? You know, that's just the way I am, I can't change you know. No, like a million times, no. The Christian life is war on your flesh. It is war. That's the only right response to sin. Sin, which has ruined our lives, separated us from God, ruined other people, harmed them, put Jesus on the cross, and will be punished for, for, eternal, for eternity in hell. That that sin is not our friend. That sin is not something to make peace with, to negotiate with, sign a treaty with. That sin in our lives, in your life, in my life, it is there for us to fight. Okay, great, pastor. Well, how do I do that? Great, you know, deny myself. Well, how do I do it? What does that look like practically? Glad you asked. I'm just going to give you seven quick tips. <laughs> seven quick tips to how to fight your sin, how to deny yourself, how to, how, to, how to make war against the flesh. Number one, recognize the sin in your life. See, what happens is that we, we, we have these moments where God puts his mirror up, the mirror of his word up to our life, and we see, uh-oh, I've got that disobedience booger on my lip, but, oh, whatever, I'm fine. And we walk away. Like, we don't, we, we don't, we don't stop, and, and we don't recognize it. We don't stop long enough for us to really notice and go, wait a minute, this is bad. I hear it every week. I, I, when, when I talk to him, like, oh, it was the first service. Oh, that was so convicting, Pastor. I, I say thank you and praise God, but the goal is not just to hear that and to recognize, okay, feel the conviction, but it is to recognize it. And then point number two, it's to hate the sin when you find it. It's to hate it. It's to despise it. It's to let it break you. It's to, like, I hate this. Why? Why is this in my life still? There should be a holy hatred for sin in the life of Christians. We just, we just don't care about sins. It's like, oh, what's the big deal? Grace, 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 grace. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, Titus 2.12. 
We should hate our sin. Number three, we should mourn over our sin. We sh- it should break our hearts. Like, why did I say that to her? Why did I do that again? Like, like that should cause us pain. But number four, that should drive us to Christ. That should remind us that he died for every single sin. He died for that sin. Instead of staying away from him, it should draw us to him. He's not sitting there, some some judge sitting there like, you can't do this, you keep failing, aren't you awful, like over and over and over again. He says, no, come to me, all who are burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. He says, my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, I will forgive your sins, I will cleanse you. I came for sinners. That's what we want. That's what we need. That, 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 that's it. So even in this moment right now, that may be the reason you're here today. That may be the reason you're here right now and not hear anything else. You may need to hear that. Go to Christ. Flee to Christ. Go to him today. Go to him fast. Stop listening to me and pray to him now. And number five, to fight sin in our lives. There are these means of grace, these ways that God communicates and gives us grace. One is reading your Bible. Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That that sanctification comes from God's word. So that's why I preach the scriptures. That's why we have Bible reading plans. Like It's so that you'll be in the Bible, so that you'll be studying the scriptures, so that you have the tools you need, the sword of the spirit to fight. But there's prayer, and there's, there's being around other Christians, and there's communion, and there's, there's baptism. There's all these ways that God communicates grace so that we have the strength and the tools that we need to fight our sin. Number six, remove temptations to sin. Remove temptations. Like, uh, that's kind of like, duh, of course. Well, Romans 13, 14 says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't even give it an opportunity to sin. So, so don't put yourself in harm's way. You know, don't, don't go to that place. Don't, don't talk to that person. Don't, don't go to the place that's going to stir up those desires for temptation. Like, don't even go to it. Just, just anything that stirs up the passions and desires, just avoid it. Don't give it an opportunity, Romans 13, 14. And then number seven, attack a specific sin. Number seven, attack a specific sin. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, abstain from the lust that wage war against your soul abstain from it. Stop it. So, so what does that look like in our lives? Well, if it's gossip, if it's lack of faith in God, if it's, if it's being unreliable, if it's being harsh, or if it's pornography, what I would say is focus on one sin for like three to six months. See, what happens is we hear a message like this, and we're like, it's too big, like, because there's, like, laziness, and there's lack of trust in God, and there's lust, and there's um, lying, and there's, there's, like, all of these things. Like, where do I start? Just start with one and say, for the next three months, six months, whatever, I'm just going to focus on this sin. I'm going to read books about it. I'm going to memorize scripture about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my whole, my, my whole next three to six months, I'm going to pray about this fighting, attacking, trying to kill this sin. Now, is, are you going to put that sin to death? Well, not unless you die. So no, you're not, unless you die. <laughs> then it'll be put to death. But what will it do? You focus on that for three to six months. What's going to happen is that you're going to weaken its influence on your life. You're going to attack it. You're going to cut its legs out from under it. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to silence its influence. You're going to, you're going to, it's going to work in such a way that it's weakened in your life, and you're going to see yourself denying yourself that specific sin as you focus on it. Now, in reality, here's the thing. You, me, every Christian, we are as holy as we want to be. We are as committed to Jesus as we want to be. We are as like Jesus as we want to be. Because when you want something, you chase it. When you want something, you go for it. And so in order for us to to see Christ's likeness, in order for us to follow the, the, the leadership of the Spirit in our lives, we have to want His leadership. Now, how Christians should respond to the lingering burden of the flesh is seen in verse 25. So let's take a look at that. God says to us, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, that that first phrase. So so what we have here is indicative and imperative. If this is what God has accomplished, then this is how we should live. They're both together. They're not separated. 
So what we have, if you live by the Spirit, that is reality. If a, if a person is saved, they belong to Christ, verse 24, then they live. They have new life. Uh, the, the, the Christian was dead in their sins. They were, they were deaf to God's word. They were blind to God, dead in our sins. All of that showed up in our rebellion against him. And, and, and honestly, it showed up in our joy in that rebellion, right? It wasn't just that we disobeyed God. Like, it was fun. We liked it. That was, that was great. But because God is rich, right, in mercy, because God has great love for people, he made us alive. Ephesians 2, 5. Jesus called this being born again or, or born from God. This is a one-time instantaneous supernatural birth into new eternal spiritual life. The old rebellious you has been thrown away and this new, new you is born and this new you knows God and loves God and wants to serve God and, and live with him forever and, and it seeks to honor him and please him with our lives. And Paul's point is this in verse 25. If the Spirit has given us, and notice, notice verse 25 says us. Notice Paul says us. That's because he's not on top of holiness mountain, looking down on all the sinful little peons, going, you guys should all be more like me. No. He says us. All of us. If the Spirit has given us new life, then we should have a new way of life. So from this, we learn you respond rightly to the flesh when point number two, you actively conform yourself. Actively conform yourself. What does that mean? It means this. If you are a Christian, you are to conform yourself to his desires for our lives. His desire is our holiness, our sanctification, our Christ-likeness, our change. So we conform our lives. You say, okay, this is what he wants. I'm going to conform my life to that. So as you, we've been seeing throughout Galatians 5, growth in the Christian life is a cooperative effort where the Spirit leads us and we follow his lead. So notice those words in verse 25, keep in step. Those words are used to describe soldiers who march in lockstep with each other. Romans 4, 12 translates this word walk in the footsteps of. So it's, so it's like when you were a little kid and you're walking on the beach and you and your, your dad or mom was walking in front of you and are walking in their footsteps. That that's the idea. That you go where he goes. That you follow his leadership. That's what this means. So over time, the Christian is denying himself, denying herself our sin. And in so doing, we are conforming ourselves to what the Spirit wants for our lives. And what does he want for our lives? He wants to make us more like Jesus, molding our lives, shaping our lives to look more and more like him and less and less like us. And how does he do that? He does that by leading, encouraging, convicting us to mold and shape our lives after the pattern the Bible sets for our lives. So what does that look like? He gives us new life. He motivates a new lifestyle. He encourages obedience. We choose to obey. He convicts of sin. We choose to repent. He leads, we choose to follow. If we don't, we don't lose our salvation. It's not that. If we don't follow his leadership, we don't grow. Instead, we grieve him. He's leading us, he's saying, go in this direction. And if you're a leader, you know what it's like. You're leading someone in a direction and they don't follow your direction. What, what, what do you do? You grieve on them and say, well, the Spirit's the same way. He's leading us into obedience, and when we, when we don't follow his leadership, that grieves him. Because what we've done in that moment is we've quenched him. His influence in our life, we've quenched that. We've poured cold water on the fire uh, of the Spirit in our lives, and as a result of that, we quench the Spirit so that we don't follow his leadership. As the Holy Spirit, he, his work in our life is to make us like Jesus, and I want you to see how he does that. So we, so we see it here. We've got indicative imperative. Here's what he does. Here's our response. Well, let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. How does this happen in our lives? This is the Christian life right here, okay? He makes us holy and, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So here you were before Jesus, ignorant of, of the life of God, ignorant of what God wants you to do. Don't conform your life to the things that you were once ignorant of. Instead, as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Conform your life to his holiness. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So notice how this works. God is holy, we're his kids. Instead of squeezing your life into the mold of your sinful desires, squeeze your life into the mold of God's holiness. Confirm your life 
uh, could conform your life uh, into who he is and what he does. And so what does that mean? Okay, so I need you to pay attention. It's very complicated. Okay, this is a very complicated moment. What does this mean? Conform my life to his desires, blah, blah, blah. Like, what is that? He forgives. So we're to forgive. Can I say that again? He's faithful. So we're to be faithful. He's good. So we're to do good. He's holy. So we avoid sin. He's truthful. So we tell the truth. You see how that works? His character becomes the pattern that we squeeze and mold or chisel our lives into. Now, here's the thing. I'm convinced most Christians, again, including myself, we don't grow as much as we can and as much as we should because we're waiting for God to change us. Change me, God. Like We're waiting for him to put us on like a jacket, and then he's going to obey for us. When what, this is how, that's not how it works. This is how it works. He is inside of you, and he, in the text of scripture, is encouraging you, obey, obey, follow me, do what I say. But what happens is we ignore his lead, and we think we have a, a good reason for it. Because here's what happens. We, we hear a sermon, read the Bible, or we just have this sense, like, I need to change something about me, right? But we don't. So we have this thought, I should pray or read my Bible right when I wake up, but we grab our phones, We say, I'm not going to respond in anger. I'm not going to go to that website. But we feel the conviction, but we quench the spirit, and we sin anyway. We treat sanctification like cruise control. I press the button, I sit back, and the spirit just drives me into Christ-likeness. The goal is as little effort as possible because my effort would be legalism. Listen, legalism is trying to earn your salvation or trying to keep your salvation by your good works. Legalism is not obedience. Obedience is not legalism. We're not to be passive in spiritual growth. We're, we don't wait for God to change us. Listen, God does not obey for us. He has forgiven our sins. He's given us the gospel. He's given us the example of Jesus. He's given his spirit. His spirit gives us motivation. His spirit gives us strength for all of that, motivating us to obey, to follow his lead. We don't wait for God to change us. Verse 16 of chapter 5, we are commanded to walk by the Spirit, to follow his example. Verse 25, we are commanded to follow in lockstep with his lead. We're to be holy in all of our conduct, 1 Peter 1.15. We're to cleanse ourselves from the sin in our lives, 2 Corinthians 7, one. Third John 11, we are to imitate what is good. So we are to actively conform our lives to what he wants our lives to be. And when he leads It's our responsibility to follow his lead. Now listen, listen carefully. I'm right now emphasizing our need to be holy, to obey, to be like Jesus, to conform our lives to what is good. However, always keep this in mind. That is never done separate from God's grace. That is never done separate from the Spirit's leadership in our lives. Because here's what happens. We we get... uh, we go off in one, of, uh, one or two directions. So we, we go over the Spirit, and we're like, okay, we're going to emphasize the Spirit. And so as a result of that, we just sit back, and we're like, I'm just going to wait for Him to move me. That's not right. Or, we're, or it's over here, and we're like, uh, okay, okay I'm, I'm going I'm to obey. I'm going to follow the Lord, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to ignore the Spirit. I'm just going to assume the Spirit, and I'm just going you know, to focus on me, me, me. And it's not either or. It's both and. He leads, we follow. He leads, we follow. New life from the Spirit is the root. Actively conforming our lives to His lead is the fruit. Like a couple dancing, He leads and we give in to His lead. We we surrender to His leadership. So what is this like? What is it like to surrender to His leadership? It's like, okay, how do I take this and make it very, very practical? It's like this. He's going to prompt you to do something you follow that leadership, whether it's from the scriptures or just internally. You follow that leadership, and what's the result is, is fruit. So, you're in an argument. Spouse, someone at work, whatever. And instead of escalating it, you have this thought. Ask for forgiveness. Now, in that moment, you conform yourself to the Spirit's leadership when you do what? When you ask for forgiveness. And in that moment, here's what happens. His fruit of peace is harvested from your life. Or your neighbor is just this mean, mean lady. 
Like every time you pull into your driveway, she looks at you with a scowl, you know, or, or like your, your branch is hanging one inch past her fence and she's calling you like, get this off of my, what's going on? You know, your kids hit the ball into the yard and she doesn't, doesn't throw it back, you know, like she's just, she's just mean. But then you pull into your house one day and you notice that she's really struggling with her trash cans. And inside there's this, I should help her. What do you do? In that moment, when you follow the Spirit's lead, when you conform yourself to the Spirit's leadership in your life, you help her. And when you help her, he harvests the fruit of kindness from your life. Or you committed to doing something, but things just... They aren't what you thought they were going to be uh, when you made the commitment. You, you know your yes is to be yes. You know the Spirit is prodding you. Even now, to, to keep your word, you, you can... So here's this, here's this situation, whatever it might be. And you can form yourself to His lead when you follow through on that commitment. And in that moment, again, His fruit of faithfulness is harvested from your life. Or your friend needs help moving. It's not just your favorite thing to do, help people move. I know it's mine. So here you are, you're just like, I've had the worst week of my life, okay? Car accident, no money, got fired. You know, it's like a country song. Like everything's just falling apart, <laughs> right? And you, it's Friday and you've got home and you've got your in and out You've got your haagen dazs You've got your controller and you're just going to sit in your easy chair and you're just going to enjoy just the whole weekend of doing nothing. And just as you're getting comfortable, your phone, bzzzt. oh, what's that? Hey, you coming over to help me move? <laughs> oh, I'm so, I don't feel good. Oh, right? In that moment, you have this thought, I should go help my friend. And when you can form your life to the leadership of the Spirit in that moment. You go and help your friend. And when you do that, the Spirit harvests the fruit of love from your life. So listen to me. If you're a Christian, you never need to pray for God to lead you, ever. You never need to pray that prayer. Why? Because He is always, only, ever leading you. He is constantly leading you, and he is constantly leading you into holiness. Romans 8, 14, if you are a child of God, you are led by the Spirit. He started leading you the moment you were saved. He will continue leading you until the moment that you die. So what should your prayer be? Your prayer should be this. God, give me the grace, give me the desire to follow your lead. Help me do that. So let me ask you, what obedience has God been trying to lead you into? Whatever it is, here's the thing I know about God. He's been prompting you during our conversation right now. He's been speaking to you and going, this is the thing that I've been trying to get your attention on. So instead of waiting and postponing it, how about today? Follow his lead on that. It might be reading your Bible. We, like on the back of this, we, we give you a Bible reading plan every, every Sunday so that you can follow along and read through the Bible. Maybe it's, been, maybe it's talking to that coworker, that family member about Jesus. Maybe it's been, I need to separate from that friend. Maybe it's been, I need to be on my phone less. Or maybe it's, I need to spend more time with my spouse. Or maybe it's, I need to make peace with someone I'm in conflict with. Or maybe it's, I need to confess something I've been hiding. And maybe it's, I need to finally stop pushing Jesus away. And I need to finally give my life to him. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe this moment right now, you say, I'm, gonna, I'm done pushing, pushing against the conviction, pushing against from this knowledge that I have to surrender my life to Jesus, and today I repent. Maybe that's how you need to respond. Whatever it is, again, how about starting today? We stop quenching his leadership. And instead, we respond immediately to his promptings to obey his word, and we do that by conforming our lives to his will and not the will of the flesh. Well, what would that look like in specific everyday circumstances? That's verse 26 all the way to 610. What Paul does is he says, okay, here's what this keeping in step with the Spirit will look like in specific situations. Now, notice verse 26. We're just going to look at this one today. 
What will it look like to keep in step with the Spirit in our lives? Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we learned in verse 15 of chapter 5, the Galatian churches were at war. They were either at war within the churches or they were at war between the churches. So they're fighting each other. So one or the other, they're biting, devouring, and they're on the verge of consuming one another, which means their churches are going to close down if they, don't, if they don't stop fighting each other. So here's the thing. As we take a step back, if the primary manifestation of the Spirit, verse 22, is love, and what we saw was love is making other people a priority, then that probably means that the primary manifestation of the flesh is pride, making me the priority. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit, these are not private, mystical experiences. These are community virtues. The fruit of the Spirit is how we are to treat each other as Christians in our homes, at our jobs, within our families and friends, and, and especially at our church. This is how we're supposed to interact. I mean, notice the two one another's in verse 26. So what Paul is saying here is he's not talking about like this could ruin your life. He's saying this could ruin the community of people that you interact with if you let pride enter your relationships. Verses 19 and 20, when we follow the leadership of the flesh, notice what it produces. It leads to enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. So from this we learn that you are following the Spirit when point number three, you actively humble yourself. Actively humble yourself. To humble yourself is to work humility into your heart and life. Humility is to have a realistic view of yourself, your blessings, and your abilities. Not in light of other people. That produces pride or it produces despair. It is a realistic view of yourself in light of God. Okay, and like everything else we've seen today, we're commanded to do this. Humble yourself. That's a quote from two, two scriptures. James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord. You don't want to wait for God to humble you, in other words. He's very good at that. So before we get there, the scriptures say, hey, humble yourself. 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Micah 6, 8, God wants us to walk humbly with him. So notice, Paul warns them, and notice in verse 26, he also warns himself. He's not on top of Holiness Mountain. Everybody's standing in awe of his greatness. Follow my holiness lead, but you should all be like me. Notice, let us not become conceited. That word conceited refers to someone whose opinion of himself is too high compared to reality. He's boasting but has nothing to boast about. When this, is, when this conceit is brought into a relationship, whether it's at home or friends or at church, there's no way to avoid poisoning those relationships. Relationships can't help but begin to break down as pride takes over in those relationships. And notice verse 22, it's going to break down in, in two specific ways. When pride enters a, a, a relationship, one of two things is going to happen. The first is this, verse 26, pride will lead us to provocation. That word provoking one another, that's, that's used of, a, of an army or an athlete provoking the other side, challenging them to a contest. So if we think that we're superior to others, we're going to see other men or other women as rivals. And when we see them as rivals, we will challenge them. Now, we're going to be, far, we're going to be very subtle about our challenge. Our challenge is typically going to look like this. <clears throat> that, that's all it's going to be. That's all it's going to be. It's going to be a smirk. It's going to be a laugh. It's going to be some comment. It's going to be some judgment. They're not doing things the way that I would do it. So in order for them to see our greatness, we go, no, you should do it like this. And then you know what their response is. It is like an angel has descended from heaven. This is just the most incredible. Thank you for showing me how stupid I am and how superior to me that you are. Right? That's how it works. Right? It works every time. Right? No. No, it doesn't. It produces conflict. So that we, so we, we and he's like, no, that's, that's just not, that, that is not following the leadership of the Spirit. Or when pride enters a relationship, it leads to envy, which verse 21 says is a work of the flesh. So if we think that we're superior to others, we, we can become jealous when someone else is blessed. We'll be bitter when they're successful, especially when we think that we deserve the blessing that they're receiving. We'll secretly rejoice when hard times hit people's lives. That just doesn't help relationships, right? That's just not good. 
Both of these are manifestations of pride. Both of these are manifestations of following the leadership of the flesh instead of the spirit. And both of these can destroy a family, a friendship, and even a church. So picture, picture a marching band in a football game, okay? Like the really good ones, okay? Aren't they, like, marching bands are incredible, right? I mean, if you just watch, like, I, I watch, when, when, when I'm seeing a marching band, like, I'm just amazed at the really good ones. Like, every step is the exact height, it's the exact length, perfect rows and perfect coordination, everything moving at the perfect time in the perfect direction, everyone keeping in step with the other musicians, in step with the music, it's just incredible. Well, what we're seeing here is that pride could not be any more out of step with this leadership of the Spirit, Right? It's that one person that's just like going the wrong way and singing the wrong thing. Like, it's that person. And that, that's pride amongst Christians. That's pride in our communities. That, that is pride in our homes and our family and friends and our church. It's out of step. We can destroy a community that we've helped build when pride takes over, when pride takes us over. We can turn things that God meant for so much good in our lives in deceiving cauldrons of anger, envy, strife, provocation, and even worse. All of that can be avoided as we follow the Spirit and humble ourselves. So again, you might be asking yourself, great, humble myself. How do I do that, Pastor? Glad you asked. So on the back of your program, I give you books that I recommend, and um, there's a book there called Humility by Wayne Mack. For me, of all the books of humility that I've read, that is the best book on humility. I think every Christian should read that book. And in that book, he makes an argument uh, against pride and for humility. And then, and then at the end of the book, he's getting practical. Like, how do you do this? How do you grow in humility? How do you grow downward? And, and he says, he gives about 15 ways to humble yourself. And I'm just going to give you six of the things that he said, okay? So how do we do this in our lives? Number one, if we're going to humble ourselves, he says, think about God in contrast to you. (laughs) All right? Think about God in contrast to you. His knowledge versus yours. His abilities versus yours. His virtue versus yours. His strength versus yours. Just meditate on the contrast. And and that, that puts you in the proper place before God, far underneath him. Second, he says, think about how much God hates pride. Proverbs 8.13, Proverbs 16.5 actually uses that word hate, uses an even more colorful word, abomination. Pride is an abomination to God. He hates it with, with searing anger. So just think about that. Like, I don't know about you, I don't want to do anything God hates. I want to be far away from the things God hates, right? And he says, pride, so, so knowing like he hates this, meditating on this, like it's going to, it's going to move the Christian back. Number three, he says, think about how much Jesus humbled himself to be your substitute. That's Philippians chapter two, right? He, Paul says, hey, hey, consider others more important than yourself and all humility and, and all of that. He says, have this mind in you, this humble mind in you, which was also in Christ. So he's motivating humility in the lives of Christians by reminding them of the gospel and saying, hey, This is what it took to save you. It took Jesus humbling himself, leaving heaven, leaving perfection, leaving everything good, surrounded by only perfection, and coming here, putting on a body, having all these limitations, being surrounded by sin. And then add to that his death on the cross to be our substitute. Think about what it took, what, what Jesus sacrificed, how Jesus humbled himself to be our substitute. Number four, He says, think about how imperfect your obedience is. He says, think about how imperfect your obedience is, and yet God still calls you his own. He still, you still belong to him. He still lavishes his mercy and his love and his kindness on you, even though your your obedience and my obedience is imperfect. Fifth, to grow in, in, in humbling ourselves. He says, think about the consequences of pride in your life. Think about how pride has distanced you from people that you love. Think about how pride has harmed you at your job or at your school. Think about how how pride has harmed other people. Sinful, prideful decisions have hurt relationships or hurt people. Think about the, 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 the devastating consequences of your own pride in your own life. And finally, he says, to humble yourself, to learn how to humble yourself, he says, think about this. 
every good thing that you've ever had, every blessing, every ability, every time that you were in the right place at the right time, every good connection is a gift from him. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from him. So when you take a look at your life and like, look at all these great things, look at all my accomplishments. You didn't accomplish anything. God accomplished it through you and with you to bless you. All of this puts a proper perspective on who we are before God. Now the flesh, it's going to work against that. It's going to fight against that. The flesh, with its hatred for God, is going to linger in your life, Christian. It'll seek to rule over your life. It'll tempt, to, tempt you to rebel against God and make it look outstanding. It loves to make rebellion look so enticing that you, you, you can't help but do it. It'll encourage pride and other things that can ruin relationships. So how should you respond? We respond by denying yourself. You respond by choosing to conform your life to the Spirit's lead, and you respond by humbling yourself. All of this is not, it cannot, and it should not be done in your own strength. It is only done as the Spirit is working in your life. It is only done as we remember what Jesus has already done for us to save us. But this is the relationship he gives. He doesn't say, hey, wait for the zap from, from, from outer space, and then you're going to live the Christian life. He doesn't say, beat your body. Like, it's like, he doesn't say that. No, don't cut yourself and all those things. He says, I'm going to make this really easy. I'm going to put my spirit within you. He's going to encourage you to obey. He's going to encourage you to live for me. He's going to encourage you to love like me and, and speak like me and be faithful like me. So just follow his leadership. That is the Christian life. So let's live it together, okay? Let's pray. God, our hearts are full. We have seen your word, but what we have seen here is not easy. It's easy to rah, rah, let's do this. But in the moment of temptation, in the moment of conflict, that's where this matters. So God, help us, please. Like I said before, give us the grace Give us the desire to will. Give us the will and the work according to your good pleasure. That's what we want. That's what every Christian in this room wants. We want that. And if we don't want that, then, then we were here today because you, you wanted to confront us with truth so that we would, we would surrender, so we would give up our rebellion. We would follow the leadership of the Spirit and give our lives to Christ. So either way we go, Every person in this room has an intended response. So my prayer is that you would help each and every one of us respond in the way that you are leading us to respond. Do this, please, and we will give glory to your name. Do this, please, and you will do so much good in us and so much good through us. We follow your leadership. Please do this for us. Please do this in us, I pray. Amen.